Ida B. Chapter 25. There was a little idea trying to get my attention, and it kept getting bigger every day, even though most of the time I refused to pay it any mind. So it would wait until my guard was down and sneak up to the front of my brain. Then it would start out with small, disguised as almost friendly, up to nothing in particular questions like, What if Claire isn't quite as completely evil and nasty as you thought, Ida B.? But if I let that idea have any room and gave it any consideration, it would follow up with some bigger, harder questions that were just plain irritating. What if, it would ask, when you scared Claire and her brother, you were yelling at the wrong people about the wrong thing at the wrong time, Ida B? Or what if you weren't a big, strong, righteous, conquering hero that Saturday in the woods, Ida B? What if you went too far this time? And if I didn't cut it off right there, it would hit me with the big one, in spite of letting it know it was unwelcome. Ida B, it would ask, what if Claire was right and you were just plain mean? I decided that I did not care to respond to that particular question at that particular time. Just because you've made a thought be quiet, though, doesn't mean you've gotten rid of it. And this thought was clever. It was hidden and silent, but it was ready to attack the minute I left myself exposed. And it got me where I was most vulnerable. Miss Washington had decided that the guest reader idea was a good one, and she'd been giving other kids a chance to read, including the big-headed one. I liked the idea, too, though, because it meant that someday my turn would come around again, and I was itching to have another chance. But I didn't let her know that. So when Miss W. said on Tuesday about a week and a half after I'd done my part to save the valley from invasion, you're about, it, about due for a turn reading, Ida. How would you like to read the next chapter of our book? I'd had an answer ready for a long time. All right. I decided to say, not seeming too excited, but not leaving any room for confusion about my commitment either. That's when I decided that's what my mouth was ready to say, and that's what my body was ready to do. But my brain did this instead. It thought about Claire. It thought about the magic that happens when you tell a story right, and everybody who hears it not only loves the story, but they love you a little bit too for telling it so well. Like I loved Miss Washington in spite of myself the first time I heard her. When you hear somebody read a story well, you can't help but think there's some good inside them, even if you don't know them. And I figured the same was true for me, that all of those kids who didn't know me, and even Miss Washington, who really hardly knew me at all, might think decent things about me just because I made my voice go up and down, slow and fast, soft and hard, while I read. Just because I made that story come alive a little bit for them. But I knew there was someone out there who'd seen a part of me that none of the rest of them had. She would be sitting there, hearing my voice stop and start, slide and shake, and she would not be impressed. She would not believe in my goodness just because I could tell a story well. I saw the real Ida, Claire would say, and she was cruel and selfish and bitter like lemon. She knew I was mean, and all of a sudden, I did too. And I knew I couldn't read that day. Someone who has a cold, hard rock for a heart and likes it, who won't look at people or say thank you, or who scares children and doesn't care if they cry, who doesn't mind if the whole world weeps because at least they'd know how it feels too. Well, even if I could read the words out loud and make them sweet and sour, long and short, high and low, all I would be hearing in my own head was, you're mean, and I knew I couldn't bear it. I can't. I don't feel well, I told Miss W., are you sure? Yes, ma'am, I said to my feet because I couldn't look at Miss W's eyes. Miss W put her hand on my arm. Another time then, Ida. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. My head was so heavy I had to set it down on my desk, and my body got so cold I had to wrap my arms around it. My eyes were so tired I had to shut them tight, so there was just deep blue inside them. Patrice read, and I was glad for the sound of her voice in the blueness. Not so much the words, just the voice.